Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vuyane Shomi. I was asked by a few people what my name means. It means be happy, which explains why I'm, um, I'm usually very happy. I'm a medical doctor by training. I'm an academic scholar and an entrepreneur and a friend of the other foundation. I'm a huge advocate and proponent of their work. My role here really is quite simple, and that is to moderate the session. But to, I think it's important for me to sort of preface uh, the, the, the today's conversation with two things. One is the process of learning. Some of you might be familiar with it, uh, some of you might not. As a way of just um, having you walk with me through the journey, the process of learning, as someone once described it to me, is a process that involves one moving from a state of unconscious ignorance to a state of conscious or rather unconscious knowledge. And perhaps the best way to understand it is consider someone getting into a car after seeing hundreds and thousands of people driving cars. The first thing you think is that, Psh, if I get behind the wheel, I can start a car, I can drive off. You are unconscious about your ignorance, in this case defined as lack of knowledge. Until you sit behind the seat, you start your car, and then you realize when the car jumps and you've got poor clutch control, you realize that actually I don't know how to drive. And so this shifts you into a state of unconscious ignorance to a state of conscious ignorance. You are now aware that you actually don't know. You then start engaging in this process of learning how to drive and you are very much conscious about every time you turn left and every time you turn right. When you look at the rear mirror, when you change your gears, you know, it becomes a conscious process. But it's also a very public and embarrassing process because everyone knows that you are learning how to drive. It's very painful. And then eventually you get to a state, and that's the process we call conscious knowledge. Then you eventually get to a point where you are unconscious about your knowledge. Okay? This is where you drive from point A to point B. You don't know how many times you've indicated, but you have. You don't know how many times you've chased the gear, but you have. And often when we talk about the process of learning, or at least people learning about us, we often expect them to move from a state of unconscious ignorance to make these huge leaps to this sort of unconscious state without understanding that there's an entire process in between. So I think as we continue to engage in this conversation, one, I'd like to highlight the fact that none of us sitting on the stage are experts, okay? We are engaging in this process of conscious knowledge, and we'd like to do so together. And we understand as well that people in the audience are at different stages of that developmental process, and we ought to be patient with each other. The last request is that of intellectual humility. It's understanding that we too can be wrong, particularly about the things that we hold so dear. And so let's be patient with each other and different ideas. And so as we talk about today, um, I hope you keep both of these things um, in mind. We want to talk about how as a community or as a movement we can achieve scale. And whether you know trying to integrate LGBTI issues, particularly around you know, um, equality and freedom and social inclusion, um, and being targeted in our approach to trying to sort of integrate that in the whole of society, whether it is being targeted in, you know, adding it and contributing to the training of medical doctors or lawyers or journalists um, or, or, or pastors or theologians, priests. Um, again, these are mere examples of, of, of spaces in which we could use target approach. We could then, you know, expand this new widely. So what, you, what we have in front of us, or the people we have in front of us, are people who will really talk from their experiences as well. Again, they don't purport to be experts, but they will share their experiences and, and, and challenges. So that's really where I'm at. I'll really just use this platform to ask probing questions before we open it up to, to, to the public. Um, I'll ask first, uh, I actually said I won't start with you, Nikita. We'll start with Prof on the other side to do an introduction and to tell us briefly about the work that he does. So my name is Lionel Dean Thompson. I'm the Dean of the School of Medicine at Sefako Mahato Health Sciences University. It's, a, it's the transformed version of the Madunsa campus, um, which has had about three lives in the last little while. My space is particularly, so I'm responsible for the education of doctors and radiographers who reside in the school and psychologists. Um, so clinical psychology falls into the school as well. And part of the engagement, for me anyway, is that we produce professionals 
who are responsive to the communities in which they're inserted. So often now our professionals are seen as quite above the community. So for me, that's really the aim of my teaching. And my engagement with curricula is really to try and transform what professionals look like into people who are responsive to communities. Sanya? Thank you. My name is Sanya Bornman, and I work at the Gender Equality Program at Lawyers for Human Rights, where we primarily pursue or try to pursue systemic remedies against gender-based violence. Um, and discrimination in South Africa and the region. And we do this with a combination of strategic litigation, policy and law reform work, and this is often primarily where I interface with education systems, such as they may be, whether it's basic education or higher education or an entirely different kind of, of training system. Um, and at, at this program that I work at, we deliberately reject the idea that gender equality equality for cisgender women and girls. And it's precisely that, that idea, I think we've already learned over the last few days, that, that makes the response to gender-based violence in South Africa so weak. Right? It makes it weak, it makes it blind. Um, and it's one of the biggest flaws that we, that we see in the battle against gender-based violence. So I'm no education specialist. Um, I do conduct some human rights training from time to time, such as training police, sometimes training doctors-to-be, things like termination of pregnancy and so on, what the law has to say about that. Um, but I do get to see firsthand, I think, the consequences of not having um, issues that pertain to the LGBTQI communities, right? It's not all the same. Um, and that conflation is very often an issue that we see in policy work that is done without the input of the communities that it purports to serve. And that's precisely why you get problematic policy that may be well-intentioned, but ultimately ends up causing more problems and doing more harm than good. Um, and so I am on the receiving end when, when, there are, when there are problems, when policies have failed, um, when, when systems and institutions are uh, blind to issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. Hi all, my name is Lou. I am a professional nurse by training, a minister by calling. I work at SEF, Mukitimi Methodist Seminary, a Methodist institution of theological training and stereo, sorry, formation. Um, my job there, I teach, but I also form ministers. So that's my biggest task there. Hi all. Um, I'm a scholar in the humanities faculty, but I'm also the journalist at City Press, which is quite a large national South African paper that speaks to a lot of pan-African narratives and stories. Um, in that profession, I'm quite focused on creating spaces and platforms for queer voices. Um, with the aim of visibilizing our identities in mainstream media and to the masses. Um, but I'm obviously one person within a newsroom who is doing that. Um, so the challenges are inevitable from having to be the person who is telling the rest of the newsroom that, hey, we need to be humanizing these identities, my identity, um, and that's obviously from a lacking in training, um, training as in telling people about identities that exist outside of their knowledge. Justin, thank you. Um, Prof, a friend of mine is moving back to South Africa from the UK. He sends me a text um, saying, Brianna, can you recommend a gay-friendly doctor? Why is it? that in 2019, such requests are common? So my initial response is probably that we, that there's a recognition by the person who's called me that they, he may, I assume that it was a he, yeah. um, that he, he may have needs that are not expected in a general practice kind of space currently in the country. So I don't know that, um, all of our doctors who graduate, and I'm going to speak particularly of medicine because I think the rehabilitation sciences have 
a far greater sensitivity for, for diversity. I think that if one thinks about doctors, we have developed a very narrow-mindedness of our, of our task. And I think that the, the, the fact that a patient has identified that kind of need is a reflection on the profession. I think that what has happened in the curricula of the 90s and coming into the 2000s is an ongoing recognition that we need to be developing graduates who are more than the sum of their knowledge. So there's no doubt that we graduate people who know a lot of things. But it is that space between the knowledge that I think that that, that, that patient is asking about. And interestingly, he's asking you at a point of wellness, which in itself is something that our doctors don't engage with very well. So whether, whether he would find a, a doctor who would be able to counsel him about a gay man needing health advice even, so the, the doctors would probably be more comfortable dealing with problems he brought. But we often don't even engage with the fact of how do you engage with the healthy conversation. So I, I don't blame him for asking the question. I think that we're trying to create in, in the community now a different kind of graduate that's far more responsive to, to, to difference. And, and so while he was very lucky that he was able to engage someone who is particularly sensitive to this, the question today is really around how, you know, engaging individuals as a way of trying to have an impact is, 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 is good and, and we have managed to achieve some really great gains up to this point. However, we are still losing people by the numbers. Essentially, people and the movement is, 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 is approaching, you know, you know death or people are going to exsanguinate to death unless we're really able to stop the bleeding. This means we've got to be very strategic in how we do that. So, in, 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 in terms of scale, how do we then incorporate? Um, and please feel free to share some of the experiences you know, that you may you know, bring from Sifat Makadu. But how do we really incorporate LGBTI issues in training and not really just sort of bundle them in to the rest of the curriculum, but speak to them directly so that we start you know, generating or putting out more sensitive doctors and more tolerant and more accepting doctors? So I think there are a number of levels for, to answer that question. I think that, um, and just speaking about the notions of professionalism being couched in the idea of patient autonomy, personal competence of the doctor, and social justice. And if you use that social justice lens to engage with the range of issues, I think that what we have to do in curricula, and unfortunately I can't give you specific stories from Savaka Matata. I can give you some of the stories that are prevailing in the in, in the discourse in the South African uh, medical profession's training. But I think that that's what we have to do, is we have to make more explicit and foreground more the epidemiology related to, to a gay lifestyle, for instance. And then, in, in terms of the, the fact that, I mean, I, we were speaking about the, the notion of the consultation as a place of safety. There's a lot of literature, for instance, if you look at, at, at the American literature on ethnic discordance, where in fact, people of different ethnicities treat, treat two ethnic people who are approached for the cons consultation completely differently. So what we have to be teaching our, our students is how to engage with that, with that discourse in the engagement with the patient. I mean, we now have very clear um, curricula around intimate partner violence, for instance, the ability to pick it up even if there's not the main complaint. And for me, it's, 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 that, it's that being aware of the unsaid things, becoming more conscious of the unconscious in that relationship with the patient. And that's harder to teach. It's not about causes of pneumonia. It's trying to reflect, in, in many ways, what the social determinants of health are. Because I think where we come from is part of our social determination of how healthy or ill we are. Thank you very much, Prof. Nikita, do you want to weigh in on this? Um, I mean, you're not a sort of a, a traditionally or conventionally trained, um, you know, journalist, but yet you find yourself in a space where you get your voice out. That so perhaps you can bring in some of your own personal experience, but how, you know, you know, perhaps adding LGBTI sort of issues to the general design of curriculum could have been beneficial in, in, in your own sort of developmental process? So, I think the human, the reason why I'm speaking to the humanities faculty within the tertiary institution is because training of journalists academically happens in that faculty. So, 
there is a beneficial point, I guess, where you're able to, within social sciences and arts, you're able to engage with the multiple identities that exist in society, and there's an intention behind that. There's an option of doing gender studies. The way that we're looking at art is looking at it as in looking at all human beings that exist. But if we're looking at the discipline specifically, we're not, we're generalizing, we're talking about human beings, but we're not talking about specific human beings that aren't being represented in this world and in this realm and in reporting. So there's a, a lacking, and I think that there would be a lot of power if we are able to say, look, queer identities need to be centered. It's not something that is an option to be engaging with. It needs to be here in front because the end goal is to make sure we are speaking on a level where everyone has their humanity, everyone is humanized. Um, and that comes with training the educators. I think that's a starting point. But even before, obviously we're all talking about across different disciplines, and I think that if we're able to look at educating everyone on queerness, we need to be looking at high schools, we need to be looking at primary schools and going at the ground level and seeing how can we make people more conscious of everything that is going on around them, everything that is going on in the world. A curriculum that speaks to that can, it speaks to the conversations that we're having throughout society. Um, and I think that that would have immense value. It's not happening. And from my experience, I have been privileged enough to be able to decide I want to learn about gender on, in a broader way but not everyone has that decision. It's an option, it's not compulsory. And changing the curriculum would make it compulsory. Um, other than just engaging with the scholarly content or, um, or rather just the content and the structure of sort of academia, would you say that, you know, I mean, you, and I, I like how you speak about humanities because often people tend to think that people in the humanities tend to be a lot more open-minded and accepting and very understanding of these spaces when the evidence is to the contrary. Um, would you then, I mean, would you then say that there's a there's a need for for integration, um, but specific integration, not necessarily just the, the content and gender-based studies or whatever it is, but, but more broadly across the faculty? Yes, I would, but I also I think I want to speak on what we mean by integration and what is the intention behind that. Um, and integration of the educational curriculum to bring about change. What is the change? What does that look like? Does it mean we're just including these identities to make sure that people are aware of them? Or does it mean that we're saying these identities are just as important as the identities that you have or that you know of? Um, and the integration aspect, I think it needs to be one that is very strong and, I mean, for lack of a better, of better word, I would say penetrative, where <coughs> this is happening. You don't How people tend to interface with one or other of your professions at a time that is incredibly vulnerable. And this is why you become so important that if we are able to somehow contribute in shaping what the training looks like, perhaps those that then interface with us um, are a lot more sensitive in how they deal with us. Please tell us more about how you, you're going about doing this. From we, we are fast realizing that the curriculum we are using is not, is not inclusive. The, the general curriculum is most exclusive, particularly in regards to LGBTI and to trans people. And so in our institution, we have intentionally sought for spaces in which we are able to then try and supplement what is not offered in the normal curriculum. For example, we have things we call vocational intensives, where last year we brought somebody to do to talk to us about inclusive ministries and LGBTI2 plus methods, which is that thing is not part of the classroom work. It's not part of the normal theological work they will be doing. But also, yesterday I was here, I missed it. We, we, we hosted in collaboration with the UK ZN um, a public lecture towards an inclusive curriculum. And uh, in October, 21 to the 24th, we have invited a number of institutions throughout Africa to come and discuss with us how to make theological curriculum inclusive. So there's work happening because we realize that ministers will come out of the seminar 
and he will have to minister to all people. And if they are not then empowered in how to minister to all people, they will cause more damage than good. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, uh, for, 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 for sharing what the work, so I got distracted uh, by the clapping of the hands there. Um, thank you very much for your So I'm, I'm interested, so generally institutions have been really, 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 really bad at uh, when these conversations happen and inviting the people who are directly affected by them to participate in those conversations. I think the first question is, who is invited? And I don't think we should, you know, leave it at, well, we've invited universities. Who represents those universities? And, um, and to what extent can the people who are here participate in that process. The voice of the people who are here is very crucial in that process. And we would really want to invite people in this space to come and, and interact with us. Uh, because we do not want to fall into the trap of speaking about people in their absence, which is, which is something I have heard over these past couple of days we have been here. So we've invited uh, the United Theological College in Zimbabwe, Zomba Theological College in Malawi, in Kenya, uh, St. Joseph's Theological Institution in South Africa, inclusive and affirming ministries, their representatives are here, so they will be joining us there. Um, theological Institution from Mozambique, a College of the Transfiguration, Anglican, and there are some we invited that have not responded. And there are some we invited who were strongly opposed to just who, who found offense in even being invited to the masses as well as to, in other words, do you think this is going to work? It's one of the ways, one can never say that, uh, you know, there's one way, one size fits all to, you know, dealing with particular problems and particular issues as complex as this one. It's one off. The ways we hope that it will bring change. Samia, so, you and I had a, a conversation earlier on about your involvement and what you've seen has been happening in the legal space. Please share with us a bit more and share what you have shared with me with the rest of the public. So, I mean, as I said earlier, my experience of, of the of the the lack of um, of inclusion in the in the education system really is. Um, when things have gone horribly wrong. So, so I've had clients um, who are, in many instances, very young people, even at primary school level, um, that have experienced homophobic bullying in a school that then has absolutely no idea how to deal with, with that case in the absence of any kind of policy or guidance, um, as you've said, more harm than good, because they have not thought about the existence, even, at the primary school level. Uh, which is which is something quite profound in 2019, especially in South Africa, where we have this this constitution, and I and I think that um, we really need to think a lot more about what we mean by substantive equality and equality in outcomes. Right? Um, I've had a who was in the care of the state in the context of a, a child and youth care centre, where that particular child and youth care centre not only had they no idea how to sufficiently protect and inclusive. When I ask them about the, the kinds of programs they might have, do they maybe have a, an LGBT club or something you know, uh, attached to the center? What kind of uh, sexual education do they offer in, as part of their life orientation um, sessions? The, the woman I spoke to was shocked and she said to me, oh no, we don't do that here. <laughs> we don't do that here because if we talk to the kids about that, they're going to do it. Right? So that kind of thinking still persists in a system, especially in the child and youth care system, which remains very much binary, right? You have boys' facilities and girls' facilities. And so we really need to speed up the policy process, not only in the education system, but also in spaces like social development. We cannot carry on as if people don't exist when they do exist and they have the same rights to substantive equality as everybody else. Um, and I think, um, you know, from a, from, from a legal education perspective as well, if I think about the kind of training that I had as a lawyer, yes, we spoke a lot about the Constitution. 
We spoke a lot about the right to equality, and we spoke about how that includes equality on the basis of sexual orientation and gender. But gender remains a very narrowly constructed idea, right? People tend to think women and girls, and then you cover it. And that's not the case. And when you're speaking about the gay and lesbian community, even to an extent the bisexual community, there's a load of jurisprudence that you can learn about when you're a law student. You don't necessarily get taught it straight off the bat, but if you're interested in it, you can, you can pursue it, and you can find legal academics that are, that are specialists in it, and you can write papers about it and so on. You can teach when we are training lawyers to illustrate exactly what it means to be intersex and how it's different to being gay or being lesbian or being bisexual. Thank you. I want to pick up a couple of things that, that colleagues have said, and I think it is this idea. So, so the question that I'm having, and I'm, I'm quite challenged coming into this space, because in many ways we regarded ourselves as the custodians of the curriculum, mm -hmm. and therefore have a responsibility for broadening its diverse perspective. But one of the things we struggle with, I think, as the health professions is in fact engaging communities in their many faces. Um, my own university, I'm trying to encourage to look into Harankua mm -hmm. rather than to Pretoria as, as the center of the world. And that's, that's not an easy shift to make because I think the, the comment that was made earlier about integration, I mean, it's a really important idea but what we're having to establish, I sense, in some of the disciplines is what is the canon of knowledge that ought to be in integrated? And it's establishing what this is. I mean, in many ways for us, it's quite easy to add a selective and say, oh, we have a selective dealing with these issues. But that means you would have had to have some kind of initiation be the idea. But it's integrating what, integrating with whom, and then integrating how. And I don't think any of us have answered those questions substantially. And, and certainly in the health professions, that conversation is relatively difficult. But it's one that is growing, I think, in the community of teachers. Yeah, I think, I think this is probably one of the reasons why we're here. Right? For me, this is meant to be a space where we start ideating strategically about how yeah. we begin to answer those questions. And so as we then break out into these to our respective rooms, we start really coming up with concrete sort of solutions and ideas about how we move into the space. But here as a collective, the idea is to, to share those experiences. A lot of focus seems to have been on sort of intellectual development and how we, you know, um, you, you refer to sort of the, uh, the body of knowledge, you know, et cetera. But, uh, very little, you know, even in curriculum design goes into development of, 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 of the EQ of these individuals that interface. So how do we then incorporate that? I think this is something that is often missed, right, in, 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 in this process design. Um, I'm not sure if you can share something with us, um, Nuvuyo, in terms of how, how you guys are, are thinking about that. Well, in the, in the making of a minister, we look at three components. We look at the mind, the heart, and the hands, the knowledge, the character, and the skills. And so we, we offer two programs. One is the academic program with, with its curriculum and courses. And then we offer a formation program in which then we deal with the character of a minister. And we expose our ministers to different agencies and places in which they can then learn about the communities to which they will go out and minister. And hopefully at the end, they will have a sense or an ability to balance what they know with who they are and how they enact it in the communities they go. So it's an entire process that you can pass your theological studies with flying colors, mm -hmm. but if your character and your skills are not matching, then you fail ministerial formation. Mm -hmm. So we measure that. And so we try to bring them to a place where you don't just learn theological concepts and whatever else, but it should also change you and change the way in which you interact and live out your life in the community in which you're going to minister. So that's how we try to do it. It's not perfect. It has its own ways and it needs help here, there and everywhere, but it works because then you want a minister who is going to impact somebody's life positively. We definitely need more of you, Lavoie. Uh, I'd like to open up the, the, the conversation to the rest of, 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 of the room. 
um, Kane gave me a mandate to train. I, I'm, I'm very competitive, so I'm going to try my, do my best to beat the <laughs> clock. Um, there's a, a hand um, over there. Let me recognize a few hands. Um, I see a hand there. I see another hand here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Abongile. Uh, I'm generally confirming my pronouns are there and them. Uh, I've got a question for uh, Ms. Sonia. Sonia? And uh, is it Dr. Lionel? Uh, Sonia, I think the, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the kids uh, within uh, sexual education. And that's such a sensitive topic, and I don't think it's a topic that we deal with a lot. And uh, in a lot of right-wing rhetorics, there's an idea that sexual education is something that should come from the home, from the parents, and that the outside left uh, engagement should not necessarily have a hold on that. And taking that measurement is a taking of power away from the household. Um, and there's also quite of a trick, tricky space to say how much should a child know about sex and sexuality? And what if is, is you educating that child about something, inviting them to engage in sexuality? So how if we're interested in education as a way of uh, transforming um, our being, our uh, uh, society, through the children or through education in schools, how can we approach that from a legal point of view, perhaps, and if you have any ideas educationally, you could also respond to that. And to Dr. Lionel Ish, I moved with Dr. Lionel because now I had a friend, actually also an uncle, who did nursing and health sciences, and they only had one chapter on homosexuality. Not on gender diversity or whatever the case might be, just homosexuality, it was literally a page that they had to read and therefore either present or write a test or whatever. And it was never a thing. And it's unfortunate because medicine, it ought to be a human science because you deal with humans. It's an impact on medicine, on the human body. And doc doctors, when they go out there in the field, they engage in humans and they different spaces and different times. So I'm very surprised that there is no strong uh, element of sexuality, gender diversity, to engage doctors so that when they go into the communities, they are fully aware and understand the nature of sexuality. I mean, the pathologizing of sexuality is something that was done and revoked by a uh, psychology association long ago. But still you find that there is no speaking about that in the medical or there is no strong stern. Uh, I'm not understanding that one. So please clarify to me that on this, yes, there is no uh, strong segment for LGBTI or gender diverse people in your medicine curricula, and why is that the case? Thank, Thank you very you. much. There was a hand in the middle. Yep. My name is Martin, I'm from Zambia. A question goes to, sorry, the minister in the middle. You mentioned uh, a list of invitees that you are inviting to the state team that you're going to look into frame, uh, creating frameworks. I'd like to find out if you invited uh, faith institutions from Zambia and what their response was and which ones you invited. Thank you very much for that question. There was a hand over there. Thank you. I was the lone clapper earlier on. <laughs> My name is Judy McCauley. I'm just so excited when um, Luvuyo was talking about the plans at um, St. Mukiti, Mukitimi Methodist Seminary. Um, I was there a couple of years ago when you were having one of your anniversaries and I was one of the presenters of the paper. And we're talking about the impact of religious abuse in Southern Africa. And I think that it was very clear that a lot of um, LGBT gender non-conforming people uh, do not want to have anything to do with religion. And I think that impact is very clear from the abuse of the church. And I'm actually one of the advocates as well to say that we need to get theological training into the ministry because these ministers come out of training into the parish and they start you know, creating havoc. So um, how quickly is this going to be done? And will you also consider inviting my organization called House of Rainbow uh, to participate in this uh, program? All right. Shall we give responses to those three hands? Sonia? Sure, thanks. So the question of, of, of sex education, I'm, I'm always fascinated about how that tends to be a talk about biology and mechanics, mm. and never about issues around sexuality and gender identity. This particular institution that I referred to earlier, the Child and Youth Care Center, 
I could not fathom they had this captive audience of young teenage girls and they were not talking to them about consent. And then we want to moan about the levels of gender-based violence in the country when we refuse to educate our children. I think that um, one of the ways, and, and you're right, it is controversial and I, and I believe there's also a, a kind of a backlash against attempts to, to try to push sex education and education around sexuality and so on in schools. Um, the way to, to get around that, I think, is to include parents and caregivers in that process. It's when you exclude them, I think, that it becomes a very threatening thing. And, you know, now you're teaching my, my children something that I don't, I don't know what that's about. Or, it, you know, might be against my, my religious beliefs or my cultural beliefs. And I, and I think the, really the key is to, is to draw them in and to include them in the process. Um, I think also that, uh, just to mention to the room, there are currently two processes happening that have a bearing um, very much on this discussion um, in South Africa, and that is that the National Department of Education has a, a group on social inclusion, and they are in the process of developing a document that is specifically aimed at uh, the inclusion in schools of, uh, of transgender learners, intersex learners, and gender non-conforming learners. And there is an opportunity to make input into that document. Um, the same at the Western Cape level, they're also trying to develop a policy document and believe me when I tell you, they need you to come and tell them how it is. Because when I look at those policies, I can just see the road to hell being paved with good intentions. <laughs> they definitely need you. Sure. There is no institution or organization I see in this list of mine invited from Zambia. So if you can connect us with any uh, organization, we would be happy to follow that up. And if there are any who would like to be part of this workshop, we would definitely welcome that. Um, there would be financial costs, uh, implications, of course, um, which then um, we would need to negotiate with our sponsors, who is the other foundation, uh, to, to, to kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> if that comes to the push, but, but, but they are here to hear that for themselves. So if, if, if there are many people, as many people as can be part of this conversation, that for us would be more beneficial than to have a small number of people and then we do not achieve the objective and we do not uh, do anything going forward. So it would be good. And the other foundation is here and the CEO is in the midst of this room. <laughs> So, I mean, I, 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 hope, I trust that the person you're referring to is, has not graduated in the last couple of years, but long ago. So you're right about the fact that we had to transition as a profession from uh, stigmatizing homosexuality in its very original statements. And I mean, in the psychiatric documents, it was a diagnosis. I think that what has happened in the curricula subsequently, though, and I think this is a national phenomenon, is that there's a greater reflection on diversity. The challenge that I think the community would need to help us with is to try and identify whether these interventions should be identifiable components in the curriculum or whether they should form part of the fabric of, a of, of what we're teaching generally. So if a surgeon is teaching, should they be taught, and that's my sense, is that a surgeon should be taught even about the engagement with, 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 with the community as he's treating them, you engage in a particular way or not, but be sensitive to your own biases in a particular situation. So, so that's the question that I realized as I prepared for today is that I don't think we have the answers. But what I think this is, is perhaps the start of a conversation where we begin to hear how it is best dealt with. Because I really don't think, uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the joke on, on um, uh, on Twitter, where this old lady comes into the doctor and he says, I know about your disease, I've learned about it. And she says to him, you had a one-hour lecture for a life, I, for a, a disease that I've lived with for the last 30 years. You can't teach me much. And for me, that's the, the philosophy we have to take, is that we don't always know, but the conversation about how much and how it is inserted into the curriculum is one that I think we need to engage on. <laughs> so are there things that, 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 so for instance, if you look at some of the literature, they speak of issues relating to gay people regarding social issues and the law. 
the care provider should know those things. And then there may be disease profiles that are different for that community to other communities. And then there would be particularly, in a particular disease, are there things one has to address in, in, in terms of lifestyle? So that, that's what I was referring to. Thank you very much. Let's take the last round. Sorry, I um, check thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Prof. Let's take the last round. Um, I started that from that side, right? So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, um, last, I think in the previous session, they talk about, they spoke about two minutes. You've got one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm Katla Rochibamba. I'm from the other foundation. I'm more interested in knowing, um, particularly around moving beyond um, just integrating within humanities. How are we able to uh, integrate uh, for, children, for social change, but in other different faculties? For example, go into engineering and get into other um, um, different faculties of education, particularly in higher education. Because I feel there's a slight need to integrate um, for social change in different other fields, because what we, what what I what 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 I seem see for myself to uh, to be a need, it's because you find that there's a lot of other um, professionals. For example, people that work in the mines, or people that are in different other fields except those that are related to humanities or medicine, that seem to avoid really getting into um, conversations, particularly around social change. And it is those individuals that we find ourselves to be interacting mostly with. And if I believe that, you know, they are forced and not given as an option, but forced uh, as, as a means of having it within their curriculum, to some degree, they would also be open to, 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 to change in that aspect. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Anderson Davids from Inclusive and Affirming Ministries, and thank you for the way that which you are chairing this session. Um, and I actually want to start with a comment that you made earlier on, on the conscious learning part. So in South Africa, we have a lot of bodies that regulate different in industries, as in the case with the Health Professional Council in South Africa, and also with the media tribunal and, and different associations. But within the church, specifically Levuyo, uh, in this country, we have a current discourse where the, the discourse is around about the regulation of religious practitioners, especially when they do harm. In the previous session, the, one of the, the panelists responded of, of referring to a certain minister of a certain denomination. So I'm asking, I think this is the general question, what happens to medical professionals, um, uh, even judges, and even um, priests, and even um, journalists that have, put, uh, that have really transgressed the code of conduct. Because the curricula, in my view, is a curricula of, of conscious learning. It's also the, the part of these regulating bodies of monitoring and, evolu and evaluating, but also in learning because that is how the curricula actually changes. So what is there actually happen, happening on the HSPCSA, um, on that body, but also on the different law societies in South Africa, and also from the church and from the media? Can these professionals that have transgressed, can they still practice? Because if they're still practicing and if they are not rehabilitated, they are just perpetuating the system of injustice. Thank you. There's a question here. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Prof. My name is Ethel Kleinans. Uh, I'm a queer lecturer at Sepako Makato Health Sciences University, and I teach in the public health department. Now, I just want to uh, pick on one of the points you made in terms of we don't have all the answers. Uh, I'm doing uh, my PhD in looking at how we integrate gender and sexuality diversity into the health professions curriculum. Now, I have found lots of studies uh, on different methodologies, how to uh, 
include that into the curriculum. So there's many examples, unfortunately not from South Africa or mm. from the African continent, more from the West. So just in that sense, there, there is a lot of examples out there. We just need to sit down and work out a way. The one issue I do have, I get a lot of, I, I use anti-oppressive education. Uh, so I'm a progressive lecturer. And I get a lot of pushback from my own department. I was called in uh, to say that I'm pushing a homosexual agenda. So I want to challenge you. How are we going to change? Before we even think about integrating into the curriculum, we need to change an institutional culture. And where do we begin? And I need you to help me because there's very little support within the institution. We don't even have support for our LGBTI students. There's no structures. We've been trying for the last three years to set up but there's lots of pushback. So there's work that's going on, but there's no support. And I want to challenge you today to sit with me and work out something and how we're going to attack this, because this is necessary and it's needed. And if you can hear the experiences from the students, you'll be amazed. That's all I want to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. There were a couple of hands, being Jesse. Can we have a mic over there, please? Thanks. Thank you. I'm Jesse from Malawi. Um, I think the problem that I see is this issue is so big that if we are not careful, it's easy to, to not know where to start from. Yeah. Uh, but I think the fact that curriculum has to be looked at has been made, and I, would, I wanted to advance it from there. Since we agree that curriculum has to be done, I think we need now to talk about how can we be strategic about it? Because this mountain is huge, and the people who are trying to pull us down are all over. And I would like to suggest that the community uh, focuses on areas that can deliver at a short-term level and those that need to be done long-term. Curriculum, uh, if you ask me, um, if we did an audit, at least, of what's happening in our universities, if Copano co commissioned that, I mean, the universities that honestly are getting away with giving degrees when they are not teaching diversity, when they are not teaching that human rights are not about numbers. Even if there's three of us, we deserve to have, you know, we deserve to enjoy them. We don't give rights. Rights are inalienable. And I think for those of us who have got an interest, we need to have a clear audit. I know it has been done, but it would be good to be focused on by such a date, we need to know which universities need us to work on and where are we somewhere, right? And why I'm talking about the universities, we can build a critical mass from there. These are the people who are going to be politicians. These are the people who are going to be doing public service. But then we are joining there. And for us to get our contracts renewed, those of us who are in the university system, we know we are up against a heteronormative system that just says, uh-huh, so you want to drive an LGBT agenda. We'll meet when you want to renew your contract and it just doesn't get renewed. But if we start, to me, taking a grassroots, localized approach, I keep emphasizing on the global, because we are in that nexus of having to pick what is said is global, but show the local examples. So to me, it is focusing on that, and then the people who are decision makers. For me, when I look at the people in politics, there are people who drive me crazy, and if they're here, they'll forgive me economists. I don't understand when they are doing their budgets, they don't seem to understand that behind the figures are people. And you can't always tell me that, um, can you prove this? I cannot prove my, my identity. I'm here, right? So if you do a budget, can you do a budget that all of us, for example, before anyone says this budget is gender responsive, 
let's have this following yardstick. Now, there are some people who would say, let's just have a curriculum all over. I'm suggesting let's be targeted. Yeah. Because there are so many things that we need to do. Let's be targeted. Uh, people who are uh, curriculum developers, can they be gotten together? And also, we need to calculate the cost of ignoring the LGBTI question. The world we live in listens when we talk about what they are losing. The healthcare sector alone, if they get to know how much they are losing, it gets them to think, you know? And then let's make use of our champions. Uh, next week we'll be meeting the HIV champions. I think we've met, we, we, we meet them together with Steve there. Why can't we also have LGBTI champions? who we'll sit down and tell the world that we might be famous, but we are here, and you people have to deal with us. They don't need anybody's whatever, but they actually push this agenda. So to me, I think it's curriculum that is needed. Let us start reading LGBTI-friendly. I would want to watch cartoons that actually show that there are people who are not the, the binary that we are being sold. This should start from early childhood. Let's not just look at the university. It should start, I would want a necessary approach, a foundational approach. Let's not try and correct this when someone is in the White House, so to speak. Let's clear it now. They should crawl in an LGBTI way, if you want to hear from me. And they should also be able to learn to walk in a way that is friendly to everybody. And know that humanity is diverse. To be different is not a crime. So we want to see this right from the time people are what? These parent groups. So in other words, someone would ask, do we have a one-size-fits-all? No. Let's target and see what we are able to do. We cannot do everything in one day. The problem I see sometimes for us trying to disturb the norm, we evaluate ourselves on two seconds of work. Mm. Let's also be very kind to ourselves. We have done a lot to be able to meet here and do the advancements. Same with the curriculum. Now let's prioritize, sit down, what we need to do. What is doable, then we are going to start with this. Long term, we'll do the other. Otherwise, we'll, we'll just get tired before we even start. Thank you very much, Jesse. I'm glad that these are not just questions, um, they're also comments. And so there were two hands which we will take, after which we'll have um, quick responses to the questions and closing remarks. Um, good afternoon, everyone, once again. Uh, my question is um, to Dr. Lionel. Um, I just want to know, uh, my name is Crystal. I'm from Intersex, South Africa. Um, so almost every Intersex person that you speak to um, has been um, uh, humiliated by the medical fraternity, and I call it a fraternity um, because of the patriarchy. Um, and um, with intersex surgeries, it's the biggest thing that we are fighting as an organization um, is intersex genital uh, mutilation. And almost every intersex person um, that you speak to will say that they were treated like a science project. Um, and many intersex people had photos taken of their bodies. Uh, many intersex people had the professor calling 10 students to come look at their naked body. Um, so my question is just what happens to this research because people go through so much trauma in life um, just in order to get an answer from the doctor as to what is wrong. Um, and i also like to know, we had a national engagement in 2017. Um, we invited the Department of Health, but they didn't come. Um, someone came and we asked them, within the training of, of medical doctors, um, do they speak about intersex issues? As we are aware, there are more than 40 variations of someone being intersex. Um, the answer that we got is something that they um, work on one day and then they are, they are over with that. And I mean, if there's 40 variations and humans are so different and gender is not just um, to the binary of male and female, but on a spectrum, um, if there's 40 variations, why is there only one day within the curriculum um, for doctors to deal with intersex patients? Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I want to say that, um, and this is really in the interest of protecting my panelists, that they are not experts. And so they'll do their best to respond where they can and where they fall short. We are grateful that we have the other foundation that will continue the work. Um, and these questions have been posed to all of us where we cannot, you know, fully answer them. I hope that we will continue these conversations and during the breakout sessions and long after this um, conference um, finishes. So, Prof, quick responses. Oh, sorry, 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 I missed, I missed you. I apologize. 
Sorry. Isn't talking about how the curriculums themselves, I use the word, need to be decolonized. Mm -hmm. So we work off the assumption that gender and sex is a binary in all of the kind of fields that have been mentioned. Medicine, while well, they may like teach in a one day session, okay, there are multiple genders and there are variations of sexes. So much of the research is based on like men and women. And so how does that, how do you teach all of this historical research that's been done in that way through that lens? but then you're also saying, okay, but now we're moving towards a future where this is, but all the content that they're learning is on their research is based on the gender assumption. In terms of law, where I just, you're, I'm interested to hear where you think definitions of gender and sex go in the institution, because the way sex and gender are defined in different places allows things, certain things to happen, doesn't allow certain things to happen, so maybe your case about the prisons, um, and also just in terms of binaries, for, for example, South Africa, if you transition, if you get medically uh, affirming surgery, you then have to change your gender marker. You're, you're required to change your gender marker, otherwise it's criminal. So this idea that you move from point A to B and whether you think there's possibilities for genders and sexes outside of that and how we go about that. And in terms of healthcare and nursing too, how that happens, I've been at the hospital multiple times and have to argue about people getting into wards that they want to and need to be in. And in terms of humanities, how does the language go? Because I think humanities has the language. We talk about epistemologies, we talk about genders, we talk about cisnormativity, but that doesn't always go into the mainstream. And with working in journalism, how, how, are, you, how are you moving towards that? Some of those questions, and again, we may not be able to re respond to them to your satisfaction. We'll continue the conversation. But Prof, quick response. And, rap and concluding remarks. So I want to just, and I, and I don't know the issues around intersex at all. I do think that part of our challenge in the medical curriculum is teaching to novelty. And so the intersex patient may well be the novel patient on the ward that everybody has to see. And then that's unfortunate, something that, that's grown in medicine over time. So rare is almost seen as intriguing rather than as part of a, a, a spectrum of things. But I can't, I can't speak to those issues any more than that. I, I think there are creative ways of dealing with different curricula. For instance, the engineering course at WITS teaches a literature course in first year to engineers. And so that's a different way. So the, that might be the opportunity that you're talking about, is that in that, that, that set of literatures that they're exposed to, is it broader than just um, a, a single group of authors that they may be referring to? I think the question by Mr. Kleinans is probably the most important one, certainly for me and an institution. So I don't come here representing SMU, but it, it's, it's who I am by what I do. And I think that what's happening in the schools at the moment is that there's a, there's a groundswell of curricular reformation or change. And I think I'm quite happy to have that conversation about what the strategic interventions are. You know, for instance, if we look at medicine, the reflections on how do you create a socially accountable individual as a professional is now becoming part of the discourse at, at SMU. It's a curriculum that's been really steeped in primary care, there's no doubt for medicine. But maybe we must have the conversation about what the strategic intervention is. Because she's right that you can't do all of the things all of the time. Um, we certainly can't guarantee that the, the percentages for, for issues around uh, the community increase substantially. But it is the space in between the power that we need to engage. Thank you. Sonia? Thanks. So about the question around what happens to judges or even lawyers that, 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 uh, that transgress, essentially, uh, I can only tell you that the legal fraternity, it's also a fraternity <laughs> very much still, is in sore need of, of, of transformation. Um, and, and I think a lot of the systems are broken. Uh, there is, a, there is a disciplinary complaint against the judge president of the Western Cape that has been ongoing for 10 years. So that gives you a sense of the extent of accountability there, right? Um, it really, work, work is required. Um, uh, around the problem of definitions, I think it's a huge problem, and it's very typical for laws to be made at different times and then to forget that they actually need to speak to each other. 
And I think it creates a real problem that we do not have a shared definition of sex, gender, gender identity, gender expression, what it means to be trans, what it means to be gay. I think that creates huge problems in the law. It creates that gap and it creates um, space for misinterpretation um, or different interpretations that could be harmful to the cause in the long term. Um, and I think that also definitely requires um, attention from an advocacy perspective, but also from a jurisprudential perspective. Um, it's very typical for, for laws to be, to be disparate and to not speak to each other, and, and, and I think that that is something that we really need to, um, to think about. This idea that uh, you are moving somehow from point A to point B that you spoke about, that is something that we were at great pains to explain very carefully to the judge is not a thing when we were litigating this case that you referred to. Um, there is this misconception that you're on a journey from point A to B, culminating in surgery, and, then, and, and now you are trans. And I think that we need to actively um, engage the, the, ju the judiciary when these issues are in front of the bench to make it very clear that that is not the correct way to think about it. Um, and, and I certainly hope to see that in, in the judgment when it comes out on Monday. <laughs> Lastly, I really love the idea of approaching mm. this education uh, or integration in the curriculum or whatever we want to call it from a fundamental learning perspective, right? So get them while they're young, essentially. Um, and I particularly felt that when I was in discussion with this, this woman running this, this child and youth care center for girls expressing concern that if they speak about sex and sexuality and, and gender identity to their, to, their, um, to their residents, that they're somehow going to, I don't know, encourage them to do something. It's like, honey, they're already doing it. And if you're not, and if you, if you, if you purport to be someone who is, uh, who's looking after young people and you don't know that, then you really don't have a place, actually, um, in looking after, after young people. The train has left the station and you better get on it. Thank you very much, Sonia. Sure. The, the faith-based arena in Africa is a very complex landscape. Mm -hmm. There are traditional denominations, there are African-initiated churches, there are charismatic and all these other movements that come into being. Um, so it's very difficult to deal with accountability in such a diverse and sometimes um, uh, um, not, not integrated and willing to integrate kind of space. Some churches don't want to become part of the Council of Churches and others, you know, so it's, it's very difficult. But each denomination at least, um, or each uh, faith-based group, should have its internal measures of accountability. That if Luvuyo transgresses the rules, they are able to deal with Luvuyo and sort him out and deal with him and then go into the public and say, Luvuyo has done this. And as a result, these were the consequences. And therefore, you know that kind of stuff. But also the benefit of becoming part of a collective of faith-based organizations and institutions wherein we hold each other accountable is very, very important. So that um, is, is, is crucial in dealing with transgressions and ways in which people behave in their personal capacity or in their official capacity within the space of religion. As, as my parting shot, um, I, 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 I am appreciating the fact that there is much learning that, that churches have to gain from interaction with uh, groups of this nature. Churches have always thought that they are the ones that can speak down upon people and say things to people and tell people how to live, prescribe to people how to do things. But this time around in this conversation, I think churches should eat a humble pie and sit down and say, come teach us. Because there's a lot to learn and we can only grow if we allow these spaces to come to us and say to us, actually, this is who we are, and this is how you can deal with us in ways that will bring life to both you and ourselves. Thank you so much for that. Nikit. Um, I think for me, I can say across all the disciplines within higher education, 
we need to acknowledge that each and every person, as in the students, are there to become critical thinkers and to become people who are asking the necessary questions. So the point that Nigel brought up about language, that's the starting point of how we can queer the curriculum. Looking at language, language that is subverting from the prescribed binaries, whether that's sexuality or gender, and through language that if we're using language that is affirming and inclusive, we're already starting the conversation there, and that's the starting point of, to take us further. Yeah. Thank you very much. It is very clear that uh, we've got our work cut out for us, and I invite everyone to participate in whatever their capacity. Um, please help me in thanking our panelists for availing themselves to help us facilitate this conversation. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank, this is, do you want to pass it down? Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for engaging us with kindness. And, and I hope we continue um, this conversation. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very much. Very